All of you, like it or not, are breathing pieces of defecating meat that from a purely biological perspective uh, are no more significant or enduring than lizards or potatoes. We are these creatures that can think these grand thoughts, but ultimately we go deep into the ground to rot for eternity. The only real guarantee in life is that it will end, and yet the Western world has been trained excessively to believe that avoidance of death is possible. At bottom, said Sigmund Freud, no one believes in his own death. In my last video, I discussed how the denial of death has harmful impacts on those that are dying and those that are dealing with the death of someone that they love. In this video, I want to discuss the broader political problems of our inability to confront our finitude. What I'd like to put forward is that behind a lot of our violence, bigotry, amnesia about history, destruction of nature, and inability to confront some of the world's most pressing problems, lies our mortal terror. Ernest Becker, in his award-winning book, The Denial of Death, argues that the awareness humans have of our mortality creates a profound subconscious anxiety. And one of the ways we deal with this death anxiety is by identifying with an immortality system, like a religious group or political system or race whose meaning seems permanent and enduring, unperishable, godlike. We convince ourselves that by identifying with these immortality systems, some vestige of our existence will persist over time because we are part of something that cannot die. The hope and belief is that the things man creates in society are of lasting worth and meaning, that they outlive or outshine death and decay. But Becker argues that if we run into a different immortality system, then our vital sense of immortality is threatened. No wonder people go into a rage over fine points of belief. If your adversary wins an argument about truth, you die. Your immortality system has been shown to be fallible. Your life becomes fallible. So Becker argues that in an attempt to keep fleeing from death, we have to affirm that our immortality system is good and right and will last. So we convince people who are different to dispose of their beliefs and adopt ours instead. And if that doesn't work, then we attack, degrade, preferably kill them. Just kill those bastards, thus proving uh, that your ideas and your God are superior after all. My God is better than your God, and we will kick your ass to prove it. Continuing Becker's work, terror management theory empirically verified Becker's claims through social psychological studies. These studies found that people who are superficially reminded of death denigrate members of other groups. When people are reminded of their mortality, for example, by completing a death anxiety questionnaire, or being interviewed in front of a funeral parlor, or even exposed to the word death that's flashed so rapidly on a computer screen, 28 milliseconds, that you don't know that you've even seen anything, uh, when people are reminded of their own death, Christians, for example, become more derogatory towards Jews, and Jews become more hostile towards Muslims. Germans sit further away from Turkish people. Americans reminded of death become more physically aggressive to other Americans that don't share uh, their political beliefs. Iranians reminded of death are more supportive of suicide bombing and, and they're more willing to consider becoming martyrs themselves. Americans reminded of their mortality become more enthusiastic about preemptive nuclear, chemical and biological attacks against countries who pose no direct threat to us. There's a strong positive correlation between death anxiety and materialism. That is, people with high death anxiety tend to be much more materialistic. Secondly, following death reminders, people have higher fiscal aspirations and say they intend to spend more uh, on clothing and entertainment. Death reminders also make people yearn for high-status luxury goods like Lexuses and Rolexes. And after thinking about their own death, 
People asked to draw pictures of coins and dollar bills actually draw bigger images. Money literally looms larger when death is on our minds. And really interestingly, after just handing people some money and having them count it, uh, people's death anxiety is reduced. So war, violence, bigotry, authoritarianism, desire to amass wealth and power may be indicators of our decreasing ability to face death with acceptance and dignity. Our terror of death may also be contributing to our alienation from and destruction of nature. We can't handle the fact that we are part of nature and like everything else in nature, we too must decay and die. So we exploit, dominate and distance ourselves from nature so that we can convince ourselves that we are fundamentally different from and superior to them. That way we can deny our mortal nature, our creatureliness and avoid the terror of death. The uniquely human fear of death also contributes to environmental problems by fostering discomfort with nature. After all, everything in nature is of finite duration and will eventually decay and die. And laboratory studies confirm that intimations of mortality increase our contempt for and disregard of nature. After thinking about their death, people deny that humans are animals. After thinking about their death, people have more negative attitudes towards animals and consider it more appropriate to kill animals for reasons other than food and medical research. When people are reminded of death, they become more uncomfortable with their own bodies, including basic biological functions. Uh, even sex becomes more aversive after one is reminded of death. Death reminders also make people more uncomfortable in natural settings as opposed to cultivated surroundings and more willing to exploit natural resources such as forests for personal gain. When people are reminded of their mortality, they are very uncomfortable in nature. There's some Dutch psychologists that I like a lot and they showed Dutch people pictures of forests and pictures of suburban neighborhoods with lawns and stuff. And what they found is that in control conditions, the Dutch participants liked the forests more than the suburban neighborhoods, but when they were reminded of their mortality, uh, they liked the neighborhoods better than the forest. So perhaps our terror of death is one of the contributing factors that is leading to the human-made sixth mass extinction on Earth. Our terror of death leads us to attempt to preserve and extend our individual lifetimes for as long as possible to avoid and escape death. We have perfected the most sophisticated machines to keep bodies functioning. We have become experts at keeping people alive. Please, doctor, do something else. Perform a miracle. So you add another life prolonging procedure, another chemotherapy, another surgery, another machine. To me it's a projection of our own fears and our own inability to let go. But Sad Lord, one of my favourite YouTubers ever, made a brilliant point in their video on death that life extension does not reduce death but just displaces death onto others. Because we are so afraid of our own deaths, we clamor for anything that can extend our lives, for anything that can put death out of mind for ourselves and our loved ones. And what that winds up doing is that we actually put off a greater portion of death onto the earth um, and the land that we're exploiting, onto indigenous peoples and peoples of color around the world, as especially like people in the global south. It's not, it's not a net benefit for humanity when one society is so pathologically afraid of death that it cannot reconcile with it and that it will exploit land and exploit other peoples to avoid it because it has results like the the chemicals that we extract in order to create the products that extend our lives and ensure us health and safety in the individual sense of health and safety in the west come at the expense 
of poor working conditions, dangerous working conditions, um, you know, like ecological contamination and environmental racism um, in indigenous communities on Turtle Island and for communities of people of color around the world. Um, we're not actually improving life. We're not actually improving the quality of human life around the world. We're actually deteriorating it. So the, the cost of the avoidance of death is manifold and massive. Um, and I think that it's actually an incredibly pertinent and important spiritual mission for people in the West specifically to change their relationship to death personally and on a broader scale. The terror of death may also mean that we're not mindful of the consequences our actions have on the distant future because we don't want to think about a time when we're not here anymore and we don't want to deal with our cosmic insignificance, the fact that when we're no longer here, the universe will hum along, barely missing a beat. So we hyperfixate on ourselves and our individual lifetimes, barely giving a thought to the impact things like climate catastrophe and artificial intelligence will have on generations to come. Many indigenous cultures, on the other hand, incorporate a care for future generations into their worldview. There's a teaching that's found within many indigenous cultures that talks about uh, the seven generations the need to consider our impacts on each other, on our environment, and for those faces who have yet to come. So when you see the seven generations represented in a pictograph or within an illustration, you'll see that these seven figures are connected. You'll see that there's a thread that binds all of them. And this again reinforces and really pauses us to consider our relation, our interconnection, and our dependency on each other from those that have come before us and for those that will come after us. We spend time as a great-grandparent, a grandparent, you know, a parent, a child, a grandchild, and a great-grandchild. And so the foundational principle of the seven generations, as I know it to be, is that our choices, our behaviors, and our mistakes reverberate that far throughout history. And so really we challenge ourselves, we challenge each other to make our decisions and our impacts within creation, within that timeline, to respect and care for those seven generations. If we weren't so terrified of death, maybe it would be easier for us to truly grapple with the time span lying ahead and the obligations and responsibilities we have to our planetary future. And maybe we could begin to take proper stewardship of our planet. Our terror of death may be one of the reasons why we generally have such a disregard for history. It's difficult for us to look at the past because it's a reminder of our precarity, the fact that we too will someday meet the same fate as all those that died before us. And it's terrifying to realise that our being here is so unlikely that the slightest rearrangement of history and we wouldn't be here at all. One of the problems of our denial of the past is that we don't take accountability or make reparations for the injustices that we inflicted. The erasure of indigenous history is an erasure of 500 years of murder. The British have never taken accountability for our colonization of the world. The US has never learnt from the destruction caused by their foreign military interventions. So history keeps repeating itself. Our denial of the past also means that we don't look at the small histories all around us. The sweatshop labour that produced my t-shirt, the baby cow wrenched from her mother for your glass of milk, the underpaid working class barely making ends meet that clean our workplace bathrooms, a social system full of exploitation and human suffering we might say, should be haunted by the miseries it proliferates. The denial of the past also means that we don't recognise all the gifts that we have been given from previous generations. Man is born a debtor to society. From the labour that built our cities to medical breakthroughs to the activists that fought for our liberation, we all have so much to be grateful for. 
Grappling with all the gratitude we must have necessitates recognising that just as we received so much from our predecessors, we have an obligation and responsibility to pay it forward to our descendants, to take care of those that come after us. In a culture so terrified of death, we're all supposed to look and act like we can live forever with eternal youthfulness, vitality and productivity. We shun and reject older people as stupid, decrepit and useless, hiding them away in care homes because they're a terrifying reminder of our finitude. People do think that you're a bit, you know, you've gone a bit. There is a, 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 a thought in society that older people are useless, yes. Italian people, when they're old, they look after them. English well, they people, on your, on your, they put yeah. them in a home. If you've never been lonely, you don't realise what it is like. It feels as though you've been dumped in the deep end and there's nobody there to rescue you. Other cultures have a totally different relationship to the ageing. Amongst the beaver people of the eastern foothills of the Rocky Mountains, the phrase old timer is used to suggest that the elders are sources of wisdom. Other cultures have geontocracies, the rule of elders. In India, Bura means old and also wise and powerful. Keza, an Arak Butman in Peru, states, Our old people are like a library, or like the roots of us. When we have such a pathological fear of death, we make life miserable for such a large chunk of the population. Anyone over 30 or 40 is made to feel useless. We also fail to recognise the ageing as an inspiring source of knowledge, wisdom and experience. Our avoidance of thinking about and grappling with our own deaths may mean that we also avoid thinking about and grappling with the deaths all around us. We are culturally numb to the deaths of refugees dying at sea, the homeless dying on the streets, poor people starving across the globe. On a broader scale, maybe one of the reasons why we don't do much at all about fascism, climate change and nuclear weapons is because we can't bear to think about our own destruction, so we don't take seriously the threats that these things pose to us. And maybe our terror of death prevents us from seeing when certain systems are dying, like capitalism or white supremacy. Because we can't handle our own impermanence, it's impossible for us to fathom the impermanence of our systems. At this point you may be thinking, but hang on a minute, we do talk about death all the time in the media, pop culture and news. But how much a death is discussed depends to a great extent on the value the death has for other purposes. For example, the US government visibilised the deaths of the September 11 attacks to fuel the war on terror and military interventions abroad. At the same time, the government has done what it can to limit US grief over the deaths of civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan. These deaths are referred to as collateral damage. We constantly glorify and have remembrance for the so-called fallen heroes of war to fuel patriotism, nationalism and the military-industrial complex. We constantly see death in entertainment like Call of Duty to reinforce hypermasculinity and chauvinism deep in our psyches. Deaths of Covid are often spoken about as the fault of the Chinese in order to fuel xenophobia and bigotry. Covid, it's got about 24 names. I can call it from Covid to China virus. I can call it uh, the plague. I call it the China plague. A lot of different names. We much more frequently hear about the deaths of white wealthy men than people of colour or the poor or women to reinforce racist, classist, sexist ideas about whose lives are valuable and worthy of being grieved. 
So yes, death is discussed when it serves a political or financial function. So it would seem that our terror of death makes us violent bigots plundering the earth in our insatiable quest for money, commodities, eternal youth, alienated from all those that came before and will come after us, and incapable of confronting some of the most pressing problems facing humanity. If we could come to realise the central role our mortal terror plays in our lives and in politics, and if we could come to accept that we are simply food for worms, breathing pieces of defecating meat, no more important or enduring than a pea or a moth, then maybe we could start to reduce the harm our existential fears wreak on the world. Thank you so much for watching and taking the time to listen to me. If you enjoy what I create and you'd like to leave me a tip, I've linked my Patreon and PayPal down in the description box. I'm so grateful for my current patrons for helping to make this channel possible. Thank you so much for your support and I hope you have a beautiful day.